3 a.m. in the Arctic Circle and I've joined a seal hunt. We've been out here for hours, but there's no danger of it getting dark. The sun won't set here for another four weeks. Again, the seal dodges the bullets, only to pop up elsewhere in the maze of ice. Eventually, we lose sight of the seal altogether. Where do you think that one escaped to? Uh, in the ice. It went inside the ice. My guide, Repi Swan, says it's been getting harder and harder to hunt here because the ice is getting thinner. When I was younger, I thought like maybe 25, 30 years ago, it used to be at least 20 feet. Ice that thick breaks into large flows where animals have nowhere to hide. But times have changed. We're having a harder time finding good ice. And when we do find good ice, it's, it's almost too late when, when all the animals pass. All we got right now right here is mostly bad ice. Hunting is crucial to the indigenous people here. They rely on seal oil and dried meat to see them through the long winter. But the thin, fragmented ice means hunting these days is a frustrating business. It's changing, ice getting thinner, warming up early, getting cold late. Summer is snowing, winter is raining. Changed a lot. Eventually, we head home empty-handed. Repi lives in Kivalina. It's a village of about 400 people perched on a narrow barrier island, with the ocean on one side and a lagoon on the other. It's early summer, but you can still see the frozen sea ice stuck to the shore, which protects the island from ocean storms but that ice has been forming later and later each year, leaving the island and its inhabitants unprotected. Today, the seas are peaceful, but winter storms can be savage. Pounding waves tear at the edges of the settlement. Kivalina's residents fear that a future storm surge will engulf their homes. Waves got pretty big the other year. Everybody had to evacuate down to Red Dog. I was one of them. But I really didn't want to, but my mother my mother told me to. Because I was still a young boy. Yeah, how I old was, were you then? I was maybe 16, 17 years old. Huh? Now I'm 19 now. I don't really want to leave, leave Kivalina. It's so where I grew up, where all my childhood memories have been. But Brandon's childhood home may not be around for much longer. Once covering 54 acres, residents have watched half of their island slip into the sea. Our elders used to talk about how um, this is the third ridge, and then there, there were two more ridges that went into the ocean. But now they're all gone? Yeah. Colleen Swan is a member of Kivalina's council. She says that after earlier attempts to hold back the erosion failed, the US Army Corps of Engineers built this seawall. They started in 2007 and 2008, I think. And they said that it will give us another 10 to 15 years to continue to inhabit this island. And then after that, we have to get off, they say. Because it's going to go underwater. They said that uh, Kivalina is in imminent danger of flooding. And if it floods, Kivalina will be covered with between four to six feet of water. Across Alaska, over 170 communities report an erosion problem of some sort, with 25 towns facing a similar fate to Kivalina. Seven hundred kilometers away in Seward in the state's southwest, tourists flock to take in the raw natural beauty.
But here too, there are serious environmental changes. Here at Exit Glacier, markers along the valley floor show just how far the toe of the glacier once reached and how quickly it's receded in recent years. And Exit Glacier is far from alone. A new movie called Chasing Ice uses time-lapse photography taken over many years to document the Arctic's widespread glacial retreat. Ordinarily, if you make climate a little warmer, the glacier shrinks a little bit. If you make climate a little colder, the glacier grows a little bit. And those two things kind of work to maintain a balance. But if it gets too warm, you cross that tipping point, climate no longer matters. It's irreversible. It's just going to keep going. Tad Pfeffer is a glacier scientist who appears in the film. He's also a lead author on the global sea level section of the UN's next climate change report. And we use that to try to understand iceberg transport. Tad has been researching in Alaska for the past 40 years and is seeing alarming changes. It's warming essentially twice as fast as the rest of the United States. The rate of warming of the planet is not uniform and it, it really is focused at the highest latitudes. So a lot of the changes that we observe globally are happening sooner at a faster rate and a greater magnitude in the polar regions, including Alaska. There are 23,000 glaciers in Alaska, and according to Tad, they're all shrinking. One of them, Columbia Glacier in the southwest, is currently one of the fastest moving glaciers in the world. Part of its retreat was captured for chasing ice. Columbia Glacier has passed its tipping point. The glacier is moving downslope very fast, but the iceberg calving is faster, so the terminus actually retreats, even though the motion forward is very fast. That started in the early 1980s, and our estimate is that that may go on for another 15 to 25 years. Since Columbia started this rapid retreat in the early 1980s, it's retreated altogether about 25 kilometers so far. It could end up maybe 50%, 60% of its original area. Over the last decade, roughly, uh, Columbia Glacier all by itself has contributed about 1% of global sea level rise. Alaska means enormous amounts of water are now on the move across the landscape. I'm flying over the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. It's one of the largest river deltas in the world, and perched on the western edge of it is the village of Newtok. It's a blustery day in Newtok, but the local school principal, Grant Kashatok, takes me down to the river's edge to see their problem. There's a lot of erosion that's going on here in Newtok, and like the tide's going out right now, and uh, so we've lost some land. We're standing uh, right at the edge, and these connexes that are over here, they used to be like further on down maybe a, like a hundred feet away. And so they had to move them last summer to where they are now, just so that they don't fall into the Ninglik River. Like Kivalina, Newtok is suffering from a range of climate-related problems. Melting permafrost means the houses are sinking. 
but it's erosion from the rising Ninglik River, swollen with ice melt, that's threatening the village's existence. So what, where we're standing right now won't be here after the next storm, probably. With the US Army predicting the town's highest point, its school, will be underwater by 2017, the people of Newtog decided they had to move the whole village, lock, stock and barrel. But progress has been painfully slow. Stanley Tom and his family are going to check on the new town site 15 kilometres upriver. As Newtok's administrator, Stanley has been struggling to relocate the village. And now a small contingent of military engineers has arrived to build some much needed infrastructure during the brief summer. Which way is the road going to? Is that back there or so the road, going on? The road goes, you can see the stakes uh -huh. and they curve right up that way. Oh, that way, okay. And, and you can see the left and the Oh, right. okay, I see it. That's really nice. And that will lead all the way to the airport side, right? While Stanley's enthusiastic about the help of the armed services, they will only be building a couple of projects for their own training purposes. Despite years of trying, only six new houses have been built here, and Stanley still doesn't have the money to relocate the whole village. The funding is like declining, you know, especially the federal government, you know, they're, they're not assisting us whatsoever. You know, the, and, they, and they don't respond to uh, the erosion or the move. So we're, it's really frustrating to uh, see that happening here in Newtown. Back in Kivalina, the hot summer has brought out the insects early. So safely drying fish for winter is proving challenging. We've got California weather now. The much bigger problem, though, is finding the funds to move the entire town to higher ground. How much will it cost to relocate? I think the ballpark that comes from the Corps of Engineers is 250 million. Right. And is that funding around? How, how is that going to be paid? It's not there. Um, the funding's not available. So the people of Kivalina decided to sue the oil and power companies, who they think are responsible for climate change in the first place. They're not dealing with the cause of the problem, which is what we tried to do with our lawsuit, going to the source. Because um, that's where things need to change. Their case was appealed all the way to the US Supreme Court before the council lost. So now they must rely on government funding. There isn't a pot of money either on the state or federal side. And, the, and these moves are expensive. I mean, Kivalina has ranged from, you know, 200 million to 400 million for some of the sites they want to, for, a, you know, a population of, I think, six, 700 people. Um, that is um, a tough sell. <laughs> anyway, so it's gonna be a phased move um, if it happens. I get angry, you know, I get angry at our government. The um who are coming up with uh, Band-Aid solutions. I've come to Anchorage to meet with a human rights attorney who's an expert in this field. We are in a heat wave, which I've lived here for 25 years, and we have never had a heat wave like this, ever. Every day I wake up and I look out my window and it's sunny and I'm thinking, Wow, this is scary. Robin Bronan has been studying climate migration closely. She says one of the biggest problems here and around the world is that governments still haven't updated their definition of a disaster. Erosion is not one of the environmental events, nor is sea level rise one of the environmental events that could qualify as a disaster. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is the way that our disaster relief legislation is written is it's primarily to put people back to where they were. And with climate change and sea level rise in particular, people are not gonna be able to go back home. If the impacts get worse and you start getting communities in danger, houses are getting inundated, broken down, washed out to sea. In the state system, those become emergencies then. And, and really, in the, the, the government is, is, is better at responding to emergencies after they've happened than mitigation before they've happened. 
cold comfort to Nathan and Sabrina Tom, whose Newtok home is first in the firing line from the encroaching river. Pretty sure it's going to be right up to the house in about two summers. I wonder how they're going to move houses, you know? That's something to like, kind of worry about. But I also think they wouldn't just leave us hanging like that, you know? I mean, they like, would. They would? They would. Even if the money is found to complete the relocation, some people still have regrets about the changes it will mean to their lifestyle. We won't be able to catch what we usually catch here, or pick, gather, or catch. To me, it's not fair. Fair or not, Native Alaskans are now at the forefront of a modern day crisis. Yes, this global warming thing, you know. Ch changing everybody's life. 